If you're a male born between 1990 and 2004, there's a very strong chance you would have played the Black Ops 2 campaign. What you might not know is that one of the key figures in that campaign actually sued Activision for using his likeness to cause damages to his reputation. Now, that might sound all well and fair until I tell you that this was the de facto president of Panama, Manuel Noriega, a man who lived in the public eye throughout the entire 1980s. The LA court tossed out Noriega's case, and though I may begin by sharing of Noriega's legal woes, in this video, the true indictment will fall on the CIA and Bush Sr. When Bush invaded Noriega's Panama in 1989, he called the invasion Operation Just Cause. Now, if you're thinking that name sounds like Bush is just a tad insecure, you'd be right. Here's why. So before we look at the rise of Noriega's regime, it's important to understand why Panama is strategically significant for America. Essentially, as the bridge between Central and South America, it's all to do with this artificial waterway, the Panama Canal. Now, Panama used to be under the control of Colombia, and in the late 1800s, Colombia allowed the French to build a canal through Panama. This would have allowed much quicker shipping routes between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. However, the French investors ran out of patience, and so America took over construction of the canal in the early 1900s. In 1903, Teddy Roosevelt's Secretary of State, John Hay, reached a deal with a Colombian diplomat, Thomas Haran, to allow the US government to control the area around the canal project for a $10 million annual lease that was renewable. However, the Colombian Senate blocked the deal, and so a French lobbyist who was influential in Washington, Felipe Bonavarilla, persuaded Roosevelt into supporting Panamanian rebels who fought for independence against Colombia. When the rebellion was successful, the new regime gave access to the canal project to America. So America had a big vested interest in Panama, and in the 50s and the 60s, the CIA actually recruited a young Manuel Noriega as an informant to rat in his socialist party in Panama and the Trios military school in Peru. Through the military, Noriega also came into close contact with an up-and-coming political figure, Omar Torrios, who actually had to intervene to get Noriega off of charges of rape. Now, in 1968, Torrios came to power through a coup, and there's some evidence to suggest that the CIA may have been involved in a botched counter-coup to get rid of him in 1969. The reason why I say this is that one of the plotters met with US officials just hours beforehand, and when the coup failed, he fled to Miami. Now, although Noriega was an informant to the CIA, he remained loyal to Torrios during the coup, and for that, Torrios appointed him to the head of intelligence for the National Guard. Because we don't know Panamanian military terms, the significance of that is actually kind of lost on us. Imagine it as being leader of the Knights of Ren, Dumbledore's army, or Optimus Primal in Beast Wars. So Noriega was in a powerful position in Panama, and he used that position to take part in the Latin American drug trade, mainly trading drugs for arms. By the early 70s, the Americans were well aware of this, and Richard Nixon actually wanted him gone. Now, Nixon fell on his sword before this could happen, and Gerald Ford appointed a guy called George H.W. Bush to be the head of the CIA. And Noriega was kept on the payroll, with Bush even meeting Noriega. Remember that detail. Jimmy Carter's administration took Noriega off of the payroll before Reagan's administration put him back on the payroll for $100,000 a year. Now, in 1981, President Torrios died in a plane crash, and Noriega led something of a military junta and took over control of the country. Interestingly, one of Noriega's generals who would later denounce him, Roberto Herrera, alleged that the CIA and Noriega had conspired to place an explosive device on Torrios' plane. Now, while Noriega was technically not the president, his position as chief of the National Guard made him the leader. Again, think of the dynamic between Darth Vader and Grand Moff Tarkin. Who really had the power there? And so, because of this increased position of power, Noriega's CIA informant salary was doubled. Now, remember, 80s America is the peak of the war on drugs, and so at this time, the CIA is literally paying 200k a year to a huge drug trafficker. In fact, CIA director William Casey had a four hour lunch with Noriega, and he was even invited to the White House. The reason why they were so keen to turn a blind eye was that he provided intel on his meeting with Fidel Castro in Cuba and Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. Not only that, but he gave refuge to the exiled US-backed Shah of Iran, laundered money into the Nicaraguan Contras who fought against Ortega's government, and allowed US spy planes in Panama. Seems like a pretty sweet deal for Noriega, right? Well, it was about to all go wrong for him. 
By now, you've probably figured out that I'm pushing against America's narrative of what happened in 1989. If you want to learn more about history from the perspective of the other, I'd recommend checking out the podcast we did on the rise of Xi Jinping and how he's consolidated power within the Communist Party. It was a fascinating chat as we looked at how he understands his rise to power. By the way, let's be real. You're too busy playing COD to do the research on niche side characters. As a history teacher, it's my job to know this stuff, so subscribe to the channel to become an expert in parts of history you might not have had any idea about. But while Noriega was a CIA darling, he was actually playing both sides by allowing Castro to circumvent America's economic embargo and by helping get weapons to Ortega Sandinistas in Nicaragua. What was most shocking was that in 1986, the New York Times were kind of good at their jobs and actually wrote a hit piece on Noriega exposing how duplicitous he was and highlighted his involvement in the drug trade, something that the CIA had known about for years. Obviously, Noriega was furious at this and thought that President Reagan was behind the article. The Reagan administration then banned arms supplies to Panama and Noriega tried to barter with the CIA by offering the assassination of Sandinistas in return for the ban being lifted. Unfortunately for Noriega, he'd lost the support of key allies such as Oliver North in the National Security Council and the CIA director William Casey. North was fired by Reagan for his role in illegally selling weapons to Iran and then using that money to fund Nicaraguan rebels, while Casey was tainted with the same scandal and resigned under that cloud. So now there was a rift between Noriega and America and he was off their payroll. So in 1988, Reagan's two terms were up and the Republicans were running his vice president, George H.W. Bush, as their candidate. And he ran hard on escalating the war on drugs. But remember, what role did he have back in 1976? Well, he was the CIA director and was slipping 100 grand a year right into Noriega's back pocket. Now that the secret was out that he was a drug trafficker, oh, and I should also add that he harbored Pablo Escobar for $5 billion, and so interviewers asked Bush what on earth was he doing with a drug trafficker back in 76. Bush said that he'd never met Noriega, which was exposed as a lie, to which Bush then said that they didn't know that Noriega was trafficking drugs into America. So apparently the New York Times could figure out a secret that the CIA couldn't. But in spite of this, Bush ended up winning the election and wanted to let everyone know straight away that he was no ally with Noriega. Let me know below, was Operation Just Cause actually a just cause? So right before Bush took office, Reagan announced that the US would drop their drug indictments against Noriega if he stood down as the leader of Panama. Noriega didn't, and so Bush then hit him with sanctions. The idea of assassinating him was actually thrown around, but it was the Senate Intelligence Committee who in fact rejected it. So with Noriega still at the helm, the CIA sought to interfere in the Panamanian elections by laundering $10 million into Noriega's opponent knowing that Noriega would actually rig it. Remember, Noriega wasn't a political candidate himself, and so a guy called Carlos Duque was running as the representative of Noriega's PRD. When the ballot was indicating that Noriega was losing heavily, the National Guard started beating up opposition candidates. Obviously, the Bush administration acted with much indignation, but it's worth pointing out that the CIA had helped finance Noriega's guy, Nicholas Barletta, back in 1984. And even when he lost by 4,000 votes, he was welcomed by Reagan. On the back of Noriega's brutality, Panamanian rebels kidnapped him and offered him to America, but Bush actually turned them down. On December 15th of the same year, Panama's parliament passed a resolution claiming that a state of war existed against America. Technically, that's not them declaring war, but rather Panama saying, hey, let's call a spade a spade. On the next day, December the 16th, four US soldiers were en route to a hotel in Panama City and they were shot by the Panamanian army with one being killed. According to America, they were unarmed. According to Panama, the four were armed and were harassing soldiers. Make of that what you will. But just a few days later, Bush declared war on Panama and authorized Operation Just Cause. Now, this shooting incident is the widely attributed pretext for the invasion. But there is some evidence to suggest that this was authorized beforehand. For instance, after the invasion, the mother of one of the US soldiers killed in the operation said that on December the 14th, that's two days before the roadblock shooting incident, her son called to say that he was going on a dangerous mission and might not make it home. Another US serviceman said that they found out about the invasion maybe four or five days before you did. When pressed with more clarification, an army officer prevented him from answering. The invasion of Panama was swift, but not by any means bloodless. Noriega's supporters were searched out and arrested, even though they faced no Panamanian or US charges. 
US soldiers invaded prisons and released prisoners and also raided the home of the Nicaraguan ambassador. The number of civilians killed ranges from America's numbers of 200 to the Central American Human Rights Commission's numbers of 3,000. Noriega fled to take asylum in the Vatican Embassy, to which America blasted loud rock music, and after 10 days, Noriega surrendered. He was tried for drug crimes in America and served 17 years before being extradited to France for money laundering crimes, before being sent back to Panama in 2011, where he'd remain until his death in 2017. As you can probably tell, my compliment sandwich for the CIA probably needed more compliment. To understand why us Australians are very wary of them, check out this video on how they got rid of our Prime Minister in 1975, Gough Whitlam. <laughs> 